Hi, my name is Nick Rognes, and today I'm going to be talking about the Lucas Lamer test for the primality of Marcin numbers. First, uh, we have to talk about prime numbers. So prime numbers are uh, defined in many different ways, but I think the most common definition is any integer p that's greater than 1. Uh, we call that prime if its only factors are 1 and p. So uh, there's 25 prime numbers that are less than 100. I've listed them out here. I think a lot of us are uh, generally pretty familiar with uh, all of the different prime numbers. So um, prime numbers are actually most commonly used uh, typically to talk about the prime factorization of an integer. So again, this is an idea that probably many of us are familiar with. Um, but to kind of put this into a formal math definition, we call this the fundamental theorem of arithmetic which basically says that for every integer uh, greater than 2, you can actually have a list of distinct primes, p1 through k, and positive integers, e1 through k, um, such that you can describe n as uh, equal to the product of each of these primes with uh, their exponent, the corresponding exponents. And the cool thing about this is that this factorization is actually unique up to the order of the terms. So for example, this could mean that uh, maybe p2 comes first in the multiplication before p1, but because multiplication is commutative, uh, we say we can say that this factorization is unique. So another uh, purpose for prime numbers is actually uh, cryptography. So in cryptography, prime numbers are actually extremely important. And uh, this is because modern crypto systems actually keep your uh, data safe. All of those systems depend ex on extremely large primes. And so in, crypto uh, in cryptography, and this means that there is a high demand for these extremely large primes. So how do we find those? Well, one of the ways that we can find these is actually through Marcin numbers. So Marcin numbers are numbers of the form mn. So m sub n, which we call mn, uh, is equal to 2 to the nth power minus 1. So uh, I've listed out the first 10 Marcin numbers here. Uh, and so you can see that the first is 1, and then 3, 7, and, and so on. So just keep an eye on that scale there. It's interesting because by the time we get to M7, we're already actually over 100, and M10 is 1,000. Uh, so another important thing to look at here is uh, actually Marcin numbers are only prime if they have exponents that are prime. So let's be careful here about defining that. So let's pay attention here. For example, look at the fourth Marcin number. So M4 is 15, which both 4 and 15 are uh, pretty obviously composite numbers because 4 is 2 squared and 15 is 3 times 5. And so if you look any of these composite uh, Marcin numbers, so any of the Marcin numbers with the composite exponent on that 2 are not prime, so they are composite as well. The important thing to mention here though is that just because you do have a prime uh, exponent, that does not mean that the Marcin number with a, a corresponding to that exponent is going to be prime just that any prime Marcin number will also have a prime exponent. So that may be an interesting question then, is why do we care about Marcin primes if you already need a prime to find a Marcin prime, right? Well, it actually has to do with the scale that I mentioned just a minute ago. Notice that uh, the tenth Marcin number is already at 1,000, and these quickly climb because you're uh, basically doubling the size of the number every time uh, you move up just by one number, right? Because they're based on powers of two. So like I said before, uh, one of the ways that we can get these extremely large primes is by using uh, Marcin numbers. Well, here's the thing, though, is how do we figure out whether those extremely large Marcin numbers are prime? That has to do with the Lucas Lamer test, the subject of my video. So first, for the Lucas Lamer test, we have to start by defining a sequence which we call a Lucas Lamer sequence. And uh, we're going to find this as s of i, where uh, we have the first term of the sequence is 4. And to move, uh, move on, we just take the previous term, square it, and then subtract 2. So what this looks like for the first few values are we obviously start with 4, and then 4 squared is 16, so subtract 2 from that, you get 14. And then so on and so forth, you get 194, and then 37,634, and then so on and so forth as it gets extremely large. So now we need to talk about the, the actual test itself. So the definition of the Lucas Lamer test is that it says that the Marcin number MP is prime if and only if uh, the P minus second term of the Lucas Lamer test is zero mod MP, so that Marcin number. Num, uh, Marcin number MP. 
And uh, the interesting thing here is that we call, we denote this S sub P minus two, so that P minus second term of the Lucas Lamer uh, sequence, uh, we call that the Lucas Lamer residue for P. So let's go through an example here. So let's take the seventh Marcent number here. So M7 is actually 127, as we saw before. And so if we take the Lucas Lamer sequence, evaluated mod 127, then we have that the first term is obviously gonna be four and then 14. And then the second, uh, the S of two, the, the kind of third term of the sequence there, um, you know, you might remember before um, that was over 100. Well, now I remember evaluating things mod 127. And so this term is 67. Then the next term is 42 and 11 and then zero. And so keep in mind, we're uh, looking at the P minus second term. And since we're looking at M7, the term we care about is S5. And since that is equivalent to zero mod 127, we know that M, uh, the seventh Marcin number is prime. Okay, so we know it's all good uh, in a test form, but in order to get this to run on a computer, we need to have an algorithm to work with. So for the algorithm, you're gonna have an input, a process, and an output. So for this algorithm, our input is going to be a prime P that's greater than two. Because remember, we're looking at uh, the P minus second term of the Lucas Lamer sequence when we're looking at uh, the Lucas Lamer test. So that doesn't work out if you're choosing a prime that's uh, two or smaller. Well, two is the smallest prime, and well, it doesn't really make much sense for uh, numbers less than two anyways. So we have our inputs, and our goal is to discern whether the Marcin number MP, uh, which is two to the P minus one, is prime. So what is our process? Well, first we're gonna find the uh, the initial term to be four, and then we're gonna take the, we're gonna calculate the next term. So that's gonna be squaring four, and then subtracting two, and then evaluating that at whatever your Marcin number is. And then you're gonna calculate the remaining S of I um, for all of the I up until the P minus second term. And then after that, you're gonna evaluate whether that term is equivalent to zero mod your Marcin number. Um, if it is, then that uh, Marcin number is prime and otherwise it's composite. So you're gonna output uh, just whether MP is prime or composite. And it's important to note here that this is actually a deterministic algorithm. So this means that um, in some other primality testing uh, uh, tests, so like maybe the Fermat test uh, or other similar things, there's actually a probability associated with whether or not uh, your output that you get from the test is correct. But here, the Lucas Lamer test, if the if it says that a Marcin number is prime, that's uh, you can be certain in that it is going to be prime. So there's no uh, kind of probability associated with it. So it's very cool. Okay, well, let's just go through our example with the algorithm like we did before. So uh, we're going to work with the seventh Marcent number, uh, which we know is 127. And spoiler alert, 127 is prime, as we previously discovered before. But just to kind of walk through the algorithm and show the steps of what maybe the computer is uh, sort of thinking about. So we're going to go through and initialize our sequence at 4, and then calculate the first term, which is going to be 14 as before, and then calculate the rest of the terms. And so we saw all of these before. And now we're gonna evaluate S5 because remember seven minus two is five. And we do see that it's zero mod 127. So we know that M7 is prime. And our output is just gonna be that M7 is prime. Now I wanna talk about a proof of the Lucas Lamer test. So it's important to note that I'm actually gonna be proving one of the later proofs of the test. Um, there are some predecessors to this one, but it turns out that uh, this I think is gonna be one of the easier proofs to go through. So it's titled A Really Trivial Proof of the Lucas Lamer Test, uh, which I think is a little bit of an amusing title. And it's by J.W. Bruce. So this was a proof that was published in 1993. Um, and it's sort of meant to be a simple and straightforward proof, and it's a proof by contradiction. And I put simple and straightforward in quotes there just because obviously those are subjective terms. But it's interesting here, it's that Bruce actually only proves one direction of the theorem. So if you remember from before, uh, the Lucas Lamer test is actually an if and only if theorem, and Bruce only proves one direction of that. But it's the important one that we uh, really care about. So what is the theorem that he's actually proving? Well, first we're gonna define our Lucas Lamer sequence just as we did before. And uh, so the theorem that we're actually proving here is uh, let P be a prime number, then MP is equal to two to the P minus one, which is just our definition from our set number. Uh, that number is a prime if MP divides S sub P minus one. 
So notice here, uh, p minus one and p minus two, the difference there is just that Bruce sets up his sequences starting at s sub one instead of at s sub zero like we did before. So no worries about that. And yeah, so what is what are we doing in this proof? So we're gonna start by defining a couple of new variables. So we have that omega is equal to two to plus root three and omega bar is two minus root three. And so I can see I've worked out the algebra there and omega times omega bar is uh, actually equal to one. So our first of three lemmas here is that uh, the nth term of this Lucas Langer sequence is actually equal to omega to the two to the m minus first power plus omega bar to the two to the m minus first power. And now this may seem like a really random result, um, but according to Bruce, it's proved quote easily uh, using induction. Notably that induction proof is not included in his uh, final uh, proof, but you know, I'll take his word for it. All right, next uh, we're gonna say that MP, so if MP divides S of P minus one, then just by the definition of modular arithmetic, we know that w, uh, omega to the two to the P minus two plus omega bar to the two to the P minus two is zero uh, equivalent to zero mod MP. So that's just the definition of modular arithmetic. So nothing too special there. And uh, Bruce actually ends up explicitly writing this out by just saying that that sum is equal to R times MP just for some integer R. So that's just another definition um, of modular arith arithmetic there. Okay, so um, now we're gonna take that last identity uh, with the uh, R times MP and then we're actually gonna multiply this by omega to the two to the P minus two. And we're gonna get this first equation here, which is omega to the two to the P minus one is equal to R times MP times omega to the two to the P minus two. And I'll all of that subtract one. And the so that's the first equation that we're concerned about. And then the second equation is omega to the two to the P is equal to all of that squared. Right. So keep these equations in mind for later in the proof. They're going to come up in the actual contradiction part of the proof. Right now, don't, don't be too concerned about how messy they look. I promise it'll be nicer in the end. Okay, so uh, this proof for the last two lemmas that we're going to talk about of the three, um, they, have to, they relate to some uh, group theory ideas and results. Although uh, Bruce does say that these are about as elementary as you can get in terms of uh, group theory. So grateful for that. So our lemma two here is that we're going to define x to be a set with a binary operation, and that binary operation is going to be associative and has an identity. Then we're going to call this set x star, uh, the invertible element in x, and we're going to say that that set x star forms a group. So the proof for this is that uh, let's, so we say that one is in x star, so we know that it's a non-empty set. And now we say that, notice that if x1 and x2 are invertible elements, then they have inverses x1 and x2 to, uh, to the negative first power, although that just denotes inverses. Then we can say that their product, x1 times x2, has inverses, which is just the product of their inverses. So that ends up showing that the set x star is closed, and that's enough for proof that x star is a group. Now, our final lemma here is uh, we say if g is a finite group, and the order of an element is at most, the order of an element is at most the order of the group. And then if x is an element of g and x to the rth power is one, then the order of x divides r. Notably, there is no proof of this lemma in, the, uh, in Bruce's final proof either. Okay, so to understand this, we have to figure out what is order. Now, order has two different meanings. So when we're talking about the order of a group, um, that's just the cardinality, the number of its elements. Right? Now we're talking about the order of an element of a group. This is the order of the subgroup which is generated by the element. So you can just think of this as the smallest positive integer r such that uh, the element w to the r is equal to one. So this may seem complicated, but I'd like to think about this idea in terms of uh, some of the number theory that we've done. It's very similar to the period of exponentials in modular arithmetic, like in Fermat's little theorem. So you'll notice that uh, above I defined the order or period of an element of a group, right? So we also call this the period, and I think we can just think about it in terms of exactly like we did with Fermat's little theorem. Okay. Now we're finally gonna to get to the proof by contradiction. So first we're gonna assume that MP is composite 
and then we're going to choose a, a prime divisor q and have q squared be less than or equal to mp and q not equal to zero okay now we're going to let the set zq denote um, the integers mod q and x denote the set a plus b root three where a and b are both uh, elements of zq so we can actually define two binary operations on x, which are notably addition and multiplication, but we really only care about multiplication. So when we're talking about how we multiply uh, with this set, we all we do is we just choose representatives in, G, uh, in z adjoin root three with the elements of x um, and compute the product normally. So I can, I've written out the algebra there, but this essentially works out exactly as how you would expect it to. After we're done, we're gonna reduce the coefficients mod q. Okay, so we have multiplication over x, and we have an associative and commutative binary operation with the identity one. You may be able to see where this is going because we can let x star be the group of invertible elements of x with respect to multiplication. So our lemma two says that this x star is a group, and lemma three tells us that the order of any element of x star is at most q squared minus one, since x star contains at least one non-invertible element, which is zero. Now consider omega, um, which remember is two plus root three, as an element of x. So you gotta remember that q divides mp, so we know that r times mp times omega to the two to the p minus two is just zero when we view it as an element of x, which is really convenient, right? So let's look at the uh, first and second equations again in x. So when we look at these as uh, elements of x, note that the first equation simplifies all the way down to negative one, and the second equation all the way down to one. So by the results that uh, omega to the two to the p minus one is just negative one, and omega to the two to the p is one, we can see that omega is in x star and it actually has the order two to the p. So lemma three and the second equality tell us that the order of omega divides two to the p, but because of the first equality, we know that it cannot be less than two to the p. And again by lemma three, we see that two to the p is less than or equal to q squared minus one. However, remember as we originally defined, q squared less minus one is less than or equal to mp minus one, which is equal to two to the p minus two. This gives us a contradiction and therefore, we know that our original assumption that MP is composite is false, and we can conclude that MP is prime. All right, now we're just gonna go over a little sage demonstration of the lucas lamer test. Uh, so I've just defined this function here, lucas lamer which takes in P, and important to note here uh, that P is the exponent, right? Not the actual Marcent number. Uh, so essentially what we're gonna do here is uh, define this K. Um, and k is the actual Marcin number, right? So two to the p minus one, uh, and then we define s as four. And so now we're just gonna run in a range up to uh, p plus one. And basically at every uh, interval of this loop, we're gonna take s, we're gonna square the previous value, uh, subtract two, and then mod this by k to ensure that it's not getting too big. Uh, and then when we get to our de desired value, we're gonna return uh, whether or not this is true, right? So whether or not this is uh, this is prime or not. So we're gonna uh, run this cell to define the function. All right, so let's see how this works. So for example, um, for 31, which you know is prime, we get a true value. Um, so maybe let's do a little bit of comparing between uh, Sage's is prime function, just it's kind of default versus Lucas Lamer, because you know, obviously we can only um, see this in isolation. So uh, we're gonna define this uh, prime P to be uh, 2,203. Uh, and then let's take a look at how big the Marcin number two to the P minus one is. So this is a 600 digit number, right? This is no nothing to sweat at. So we're gonna do a time for both the Lucas Lamer uh, function and then also for Sage's is prime function. So you can see here that we actually already got an output here. And this is, output is true. So this is actually a true, this is a prime, a Marcin prime. Um, so we already got an output from our Lucas Lamer function and that was 0 0.01 seconds. So this is a hundredth of a second, right? And now we finally get a result from the Sage function and that's 21, almost 22 seconds here. So you can see the difference in time is just crazy, right? 
So now let's take a look at maybe uh, some of the upper bounds of what we're looking at for what we might do in Sage just kind of uh, for demonstration. So you can see here if I run this uh, while timing it, we it's about a, a second and a half for this Marcin number with the exponent uh, 21,701. And then for the exponent 44,497 here, you can see it's running a little longer. It's about 10 seconds. So we're starting to approach maybe a bit of a longer runtime here. And but you can see here that these are not small numbers, right? This is a 65 digit number, or 6500 digit number, excuse me, and a 13,000 digit number, right? And so you can just see here, like it's crazy basically the inputs that you get. You know, you're inputting a uh, five digit number and you're actually testing the primality of a 6500 digit number. Um, so basically, as we talked uh, about, you're, you're looking at uh, having uh, testing the, the primality of numbers that are much bigger than any of your input um, at an extremely fast rate compared to some of the other primality testing that's around. So for this niche case, it's an extremely fast and efficient use of computing space. Now I want to talk a little bit finally about GIMPs. So we may be asking ourselves, what's this Lucas Langer test all about? What's the point of it? Well, GIMPs is the point. GIMPs is an acronym that stands for the Great Internet Marsen Prime Search, and their motto is Finding World Record Primes Since 1996. So you may be asking yourself, what is GIMPs? Well, it's a parallel computing project where people donate the extra computing power on their personal machines to help find gigantic primes. And this is related to the Lucas Lamer test because the test is actually used to determine the primality of these huge Marsen numbers. Anyone actually can sign up to participate in the project. So if you're curious, uh, you can learn more at www.marsen.org. So GIMPs is actually the reason that we have found so many Marsen primes. Since 1996, there's actually been 17 Marsen primes that have been discovered by GIMPs, and that's the 35th Marsen prime to be discovered all the way up to the 51st. So since 1996, all of the Marsen primes that have been discovered have been discovered by, Imps, by GIMPs. As of April 26, 2023, when this video is being recorded, all of the exponents below 112,154,719 have been tested. And now, actually, the most recent prime to be discovered, Marsen prime, the 51st Marsen prime, which was discovered in December of 2018, uh, is this Marsen uh, number with the exponent 82,589,933. This is the largest known prime uh, number that we know to date, and it's got 24 million digits. So GIMPs is the reason that we have found such large primes. My conclusion here is just thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that the video was informative and helpful, and have a good day.